السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على سلام حيا على سلام حيا على Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam Much of what limits us in our lives is our own feelings of inadequacy and inferiority this is especially true when we are constantly comparing ourselves to others. As they say, comparison is the thief of all joy. Meaning you can't enjoy the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you if you are always comparing your blessings to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to someone else. It breeds contempt of oneself as well as others. And it also breeds a, a sense of ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many psychologists suggest that every individual has what is called a real self, which are parts of you that you accept and that you pride yourself on, and an anti-self, which are the parts of you that you hate, that you reject, you deny. And the anti-self is expressed in our critical inner voice, which tends to influence how we behave and engage with ourselves and others. This negative self-talk undercuts our accomplishments and sabotages our relationships and causes us to see the world and the people in it in a negative light. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man qala halak nas ahlakahum. He who says that there is no good in people. All people are ugly, all people are evil, all people are destroyed, there are no more good men, there are no more good women. These broad strokes of negative self-talk that we impose on other people. He who says that there is no good in people, then he is the one that there is, there is no good in. 
Because if you can't see good in others, it's not that there's no good in others. It's that there is no good in the way that you see the world. You are the problem. People are not the problem. You are the problem. Man qala halak nas He who says all the people will be destroyed, there is no good in people, then he is the one in whom there is no good. And this also includes the way that we view and engage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we have doubts and thoughts about, you know, evil thoughts about ourselves, then there is no doubt that those evil thoughts, thoughts which are known in the Arabic language as suvan, evil thoughts, or harboring evil feelings and thoughts about someone, there is no doubt that a person who thinks evil of himself, without a doubt that that's going to trickle over into their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where you begin to think evil about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures a, a, a glimpse of this in the Qur'an. In, a, in, a, in Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah number 2, right after the passage of the conversation between Ibrahim and, uh, um, uh, and the, the evil king who said that, you know, I can, uh, Namrud, who said that I can give life to the dead. So the issue with many of the Arabs, uh, many of the people during that time, as well as Quraysh, as well as those who came before, is that they didn't believe in resurrection. And this within itself is evil thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because how could you believe that God who created you from nothing, when you were nothing, not even a thing thought of, and can bring you into existence. Every year Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we see the earth die in the winter time and in springtime we see the earth come back to life. How is it that we can see all of these things and then deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the power to bring man back to life? How is it? That within itself is an evil thought about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah challenges this thought in the Quran with a metaphor, a story of something, a parable of something that happened in the past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O kalladhi marra ala qariyatin wa hiya khawiyatun ala urushiha. Qala anna yuhyi hadihi allahu ba'da mawtiha. Fa amatuhu allahu mi'ata aman thumma ba'da. Qala kam labith? Qala labithtu yawman au ba'da yawman. قال بل لبثت مئة عام فانظر إلى طعامك وشرابك لم يتسن. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, and for he who passed by a city that was in ruins, and he wondered to himself, how can Allah bring this city back to life after its destruction? Just the mere thought of how can Allah do this, or how will Allah, as we say in our own personal lives, how is Allah going to get me out of this situation? How is Allah going to fix this situation for me? And there's no one who can get me out of this situation. These are things that we utter on a daily basis, not even realizing that the moment you utter that word, or the moment you even think about it, you have now subtracted from the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Essentially, you are a walking contradiction because in every single position of the prayer, we say, Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Yet we harbor evil thoughts, we harbor thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that contradict that. How is Allah going to get me out of this situation? There's nobody who can fix this situation for me. There's no one who can get me out of this situation. These are things that we either say verbally or we think in our own minds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for the man who passed by a city, who was, the city was in ruins. And he wondered to himself, How is it that Allah can bring this city back to life after its destruction? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the man to die for a hundred years. A hundred years Allah caused the man to die. And then he raised him, resurrected him, brought him back to life. And then Allah asked him, How long have you been asleep? And the man, he said, I would sleep for a day or part of a day. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused him to die, it was during the afternoon. And when Allah resurrected him, brought him back to life, it was the afternoon. So he thought he just went to sleep for a day or two. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings his, uh, his attention. No, you were dead for a hundred years. Look at your food and your drink. The same food and drink that was there when you died. A hundred years later, that food and that drink, it never changed. It didn't change. And something I want to bring to your attention here 
is that if you buy food in today's time, buy food from a market grocery store, and after a week, the bread doesn't have mold on it, after a week, the food in the refrigerator is still intact, and you think you're gonna put it in the, put it in the microwave, heat it up, and eat it, food does not remain intact after three, four days. That's how you know that it's not natural. The only food that can exist for a long period of time is that which is genetically modified or that which was modified by God. And the food that we have today by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not modified by Allah. You're buying something from McDonald's or Burger King or any one of these fast food places and you leave it sitting out overnight and you wake up the next morning and the food is still intact. Cheese which molds, which is mold, and it molds even more after a day or so. You leave it in a refrigerator, you come back four or five days, the cheese is still intact. This is genetically modified. It is not modified by God. He said that the food and the drink did not change after a hundred years. And that within itself is a miracle because food would have changed after a few days. Allah caused him to die for a hundred years, then resurrected him, asked him how long he has been dead. He said, I've been dead for a day, I've been asleep for a day or part of a day. Allah says, no, you've been dead for a hundred years. Look at your food and your drink, never changed. Look at your donkey. Your donkey died and we brought it back to life. Look at your donkey. Your donkey died. But then we clothed it with, with bones and we clothed, we clothed the bones with flesh and blood and brought it back to life right along with you. And when a man finally comes to the realization, he says, When the man finally comes to the realization, he says that I know now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Power over all things. Oftentimes, in an attempt to counter these negative thoughts that we have about ourselves, we project our inferiority onto other people. Starting with our children. Unfortunately, our, our children are the immediate inheritance of our fears and insecurities and inferiorities. Our child wants to do something and we tell them, oh no, you can't do that. Limiting the child because of our own fears and our own insecurities. Oh, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Simply because you couldn't do it. And so you project that inferiority, that uh, insecurity onto your own children. Because we assume that they might actually supersede us, they might actually do better than us. Which adds to our negative sense of self. We deflate their value in our eyes, not necessarily because they are less than us, but because we cannot accept the possibility that they might actually do better than us. We should want our children to do better. We should want our children to be better and do better than us rather than projecting our fears and our insecurities on them. And this is why in the Islamic tradition, we are taught to look at those who have less than us, rather than looking at those who have more than us, because it makes us grateful for the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, انظر إلى من أسفل منكم ولا تنظر إلى من هو فوقكم فهو أجدر أن لا تزدر نعمة الله عليكم متفق عليه. The Prophet وسلم, said, look at those who has, have less than you, rather than looking at those who have more than you, as this will be more likely to cause you to be grateful for the blessings that Allah gave you. If you're constantly comparing yourself to everybody else, at what point do you learn how to be grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you? You will never see the blessings that Allah gave you because you're constantly looking at the blessings of everybody else. What they say in today's time, pocket watching. You're looking at what this person makes and how much that person makes and how many wives this person got and who's the imam at this mission and why they got this person over here and who gave this person permission and Allah gave the person permission. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a person permission, it's not for you or I to question the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We're sitting back waiting for a person's downfall. I want to see how long this marriage works. I want to see how long this situation works out. I want to see how well that little business does and how well, how far this person think they're going to go. I want to see if they really want to build the mess shit over there. <laughs> and we sit back and we don't get involved. We sit back and we watch waiting for the downfall of the other person. La ilaha illallah. Ingratitude for the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given because we simply cannot take our eyes off of what somebody else is doing. Shaykh bin Baz rahimahullah ta'ala in explaining this hadith, he said, وَهَذَا فِي أُمُورِ الدُّنْيَا أَمَّا فِي الْأُمُورِ الدِّينِ فَالْإِنسَانِ فِي أُمُورِ الدِّينِ يَنْظُرَ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ فَوْقَهُ فَوْقَهُ حَتَّى يَتَأَسَّى بِهِ وَحَتَّى يَعْمَلْ كَعَمَلِهِ أما في أمور الدنيا ينظر إلى من هو أسفل منه حتى لا يزدري نعمة الله عليه وحتى لا يقنط من رحمة الله وحتى لا يرى أنه مظلوم. شيخ بن باز رحمه الله تعالى he said that looking at those who have less than you this is only as it relates to the worldly affairs. When it comes to the dunya, the worldly material world, you should look at those who have less than you. He said, but as it relates to the deen, as it relates to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you should look at those who are better than you. Because looking at those who are better than you in deen, it will be an incentive for you to do the deeds that they do. It will be an incentive for you to do the deeds that you see them doing. You see this person is a businessman, businesswoman, and they write big checks to help the masjid, to help the Muslim community. We're not envious of the person in the sense that we want that to be taken away from them. We're envious of the person in the sense that we want to aspire to greater heights financially so that we can do the same thing that they do. We're not envious of a person who is half of the Quran or Ibam who teaches in the community because we want to take that position away from them. We're envious of them because we want to have knowledge of the deen so that we can teach the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reap the same reward that they do. As the scholars say, the, the pen of the, the ink of the scholar, Ibr al-Alam, muqaddimun ala dam al-shaheed, that the ink of the scholar takes precedence over or is better and more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the blood of the martyr. The blood of the martyr only benefits the martyr. The ink of the scholar benefits generations. Look at Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari died 256 years after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 200 and some odd years. And now we are in 1445 after hijrah. And Sahih al-Bukhari is still one of the most relevant, after the Qur'an, the most relevant book to the Muslims universally. The ink of the scholar. And Imam al-Bukhari wrote Sahih al-Bukhari when he was only 23 years old. He started writing that book when he was 23 years old. It took him 16 years to finish the book. SubhanAllah, before that, he is 18 years old. He wrote his first book, which is known as Tarikh al-Kabir, the, the great history of Islam from his memory. Still one of the most relevant books to the students of Hadith. SubhanAllah, the ink of the scholar. So we're not envious of an imam or student of knowledge or a person who is teaching the religion because we want that position to be taken from them. We're envious because we wish we had the knowledge that they had so that we can teach the way they do so that we can reap the reward that they reap. So as it relates to deen, we should look at those who are above us and not below us so that we can aspire to higher heights. But as it relates to the dunya, then we should always look at those who have less than us because it will be more likely to increase us in gratitude and so that we will not fall into despair and so that we will not see ourselves as oppressed by God. There's some people who see themselves as being oppressed. I pray, I fast, I do all of these good things, I, I stay away from the haram as much as I can and still Allah has not blessed me. Has he has blessed this person? Why has Allah given this person who is a sinful person all of these things? But look at what Allah has given me. This little bit God has given me. You see yourself as being mabloom, as being oppressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore you are missing out on the blessings that Allah has given you. Because you don't understand to whom much is given, much is required. And as the scholars say that it is easier to be grateful for a little than it is to be grateful for a lot. 
But our eyes are always on what everybody else has and what everybody else is doing. Not realizing that the responsibility, the onus that is placed on the shoulders that, of the person that has the greater blessing. To whom much is given, much is required. The Prophet used to get up in the middle of the night and pray so his feet would bleed. And Aisha asked him, why do you do this? Why do you do this when Allah has forgiven you for your past and your future sins? And the Prophet ﷺ turned to Aisha and said, أَفَلَا أَكُنُّ عَبْدٍ شُكُورًا Then shouldn't I be a grateful servant? If Allah has done that for me, shouldn't I exert myself to do more, to prove to him that I'm grateful for what he has given me? Not do less? See, we want the greater blessing, but we want to do less than what is necessary to maintain the greater blessing. That's the entitlement of the human being, Allah Musta'an. A clear manifestation of this mentality is manifested in the uh, incident involving Iblis along with Adam. Prior to his fall from grace, Iblis held a very privileged place and position amongst the angels, even though Iblis was not an angel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, with Qunna lil malaika is juduli Adam, fasajadu illa Iblis, kana min al jinn. And remember when we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. Bow down to Adam. Ustudu li Adam. Make sujood to Adam as a sign of respect to Adam. Fasajadu illa Iblis. All of them prostrated except Iblis. Kana min al jinn. He was from amongst the jinn. So this dispels and debunks this Christian belief that many Muslims have not rectified or reconciled upon converting to Islam that Iblis was not a fallen angel. He was not an angel at all. He was a jinn. min al jinn. amri rabbi, and he disobeyed the commandment of his Lord. So this was the status that and the prestige that Iblis enjoyed from amongst the angels, from amongst the jinn, the only one from amongst the jinn who was given the privilege to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst the angels. Go figure. Out of all of the jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected him to worship Allah, to have the privilege to worship him amongst the angels. So when Allah commanded the angels to make sujood, all of them prostrated except Iblis. Because he's the only one that had free will. The angels don't have free will. As Allah describes them in the Quran, they only do as they have been commanded. So this was the status and the prestige that and the honor which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, conferred to him and which he enjoyed. But he overlooked this blessing because he was too busy concentrating on the greatness of someone else instead of valuing his own greatness. Ibn Abbas, he said, Ibn Abbas, he said that when the jinn, the, the jinn, they inherited the earth before we did. The jinn were here on earth before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Adam out of Jannah and brought him down to earth. The jinn were here first. And while they were here, many of them spilled blood, killed each other, got into wars, fought with one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Iblis along with an army of angels, pay attention, sent Iblis with an army of angels to go down to the earth to restore order. And some of the jinn they killed and some of the jinn, they chased out to the different islands, away from the earth, away from, you know, the, uh, the, the places where people were, were, were to inhabit, and sent them out to the islands, chased them out to the different islands. And it's no coincidence that you'll find in many islands, you'll find a lot of shirk, you'll find a lot of superstitions, you'll find a lot of idol worship, you'll find a lot of that in many of the islands offshores. But chase them out. This was the privilege and the status that Allah had gave them. So while he enjoyed many of these privileges and blessings, it also limited him in his belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could create someone who would be more beloved to him and would be better than him. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, it exposed Iblis' insecurity, his fear that someone with less could actually be more. 
I want to say that again. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, Iblis's fear and inferiority complex increased because his fear was that someone with less, Adam, who had less than what Iblis had, less powers, less strength. Iblis can move very quickly. He can lift very heavy things. He can move through things, has much more than the human being has. But with all of the more that he has, his fear was that someone with less than him could actually be better than him. That's a lesson for every single one of us. We don't get to decide who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows blessings on. Yes, yeah, someone that makes less than you could still have a better life than you. Yes, someone who is single could be happier than somebody who's married. Yes, someone who makes less money than someone who makes more could have a happier, healthier life. Don't ever, don't ever, you know, think that someone who has less than what you have can't have more than what you have. It's not about how much. It's about the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and the degree to which you recognize that blessing. Some people are content with a little because they recognize the little that they have is a blessing and it's more than what most people have. That is what leads to contentment. This discontentment is a disease. The Prophet ﷺ sought refuge من نفس لا تشبع from a soul that is never satisfied. That is a disease, man, subhanAllah. <coughs> never satisfied. Always angling for more, no matter how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And we will interpret that as ambitious. I'm just ambitious. No, you're not ambitious, you're greedy. You're ungrateful and you're dissatisfied with the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah gave me an offer. Arda alayya rabbi an yaj'alli batha makka dhaban fuqultu li rabbi la ya rabbi inni ashba' yawmin wa aju' yawmin. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said my Lord made an offer to me to give me a valley in Mecca filled with gold. And I said to my Lord, La ya Rabbi. No, I'm okay. I don't need a valley in Mecca filled with gold. Just imagine Allah making that offer to one of us. The Prophet ﷺ said, the child of Adam is never satisfied. If you gave him a mountain of gold, he would desire a second one. Never satisfied. Nothing will fill, nothing will satisfy the child of Adam in the Torah except dirt, meaning when you are put in your grave. That's the only thing that will satisfy most people's desire. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said that my Lord gave me an offer to give me a valley in Mecca filled with gold. And I said, no, oh my Lord, I'm good. I don't need a valley in Mecca filled with gold. He said, I am content with being full one day and hungry the next. I'll live my life between those two extremes. He said, on the days that I am full, I will show gratitude to you. And on the days that I am hungry, to the right to ilayk wa da'awtuk, I will turn to you and call on you. That's what hunger does. It drives you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you satisfy your, that, that emptiness that you are experiencing with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how we satisfy. We don't satisfy it with drugs, alcohol, reckless behavior, haram behavior, because we feel empty inside. That's what non-Muslims do. When they're empty inside, they go and fulfill and satisfy that emptiness. And no matter how much alcohol they pour, no matter how much weed they smoke, no matter how many girls they sleep with, no matter how many luxury vehicles they purchase and buy, no matter how much land and property they purchase, never satisfied. They can never fulfill that. They can never satisfy that. That's a disease that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested them with. The Prophet sallallahu said, no, I don't need a valley of gold. Because perhaps you give me that valley of gold and then I desire another one. No, I'm not even going to test myself. I am content, totally content with being hungry one day and full the next day. On the days that I'm full, then I will thank you and I'll praise you 
And on the days that I'm hungry, I'll turn to you and I'll call on you. I'm, I'm content with living my life like that. That is the life of the believer. Our lives fluctuate between periods of prosperity and periods of uh, calamity, trial, and misfortune. That's our life. Which is why we spend our lives between al-khawf wa raja, fear and hope. That's our life. It's never going to be one way all the time. It will swing like a pendulum. Sometimes things will be good, sometimes things will not be so good. The times that things are good, we turn to Allah, we praise Him, we thank Him, we do more ibadah, more worship. And the times that things are not so good, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hope. We turn to Him and call on Him subhanahu, and humble ourselves before Him. The Prophet sallallahu was very wise to make that decision. And subhanAllah, can you think, I mean, can you think about the hadith? He told Allah, no. He said, no, ya Rabbi. With all due respect, I'm good. I don't need a valley filled with gold. And that means that as a human being, you have to know your limits. May Allah have mercy on the individual who knows his own limitations. Just because Allah offers you something doesn't mean you have to take it. Just because the opening is there doesn't mean that you have to take it. Sometimes Allah wants to see you humble yourself and say, no, I'm good. And in humbling yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises you as the Prophet sallallahu said, man tawadha alillah rafa'ahu Allahu ta'ala. That no one humbles himself before Allah except that Allah will raise him in degrees. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the wisdom to know the difference between when we should take and when we should withhold. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the wisdom to know when to raise ourselves and when to humble ourselves before him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bima ja'a fihi min al-ayati wa dhikr al-hakim akunu ma tasma'un. Astaghfirullah لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين من كل دم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا في كما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا so while Iblis enjoyed many of these privileges and blessings associated with his status, it also limited him in his belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could create someone who would be more beloved to him and would be better than him with less than him. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, created Adam, it exposed his fears and his insecurities that someone with less could actually be more. He failed to see that one person's virtue does not subtract or diminish or infringe on another person's virtue. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Iblis to prostrate and another verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed Iblis's response with قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَ اسْجُدُوا لِآدْمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ And remember when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam out of respect. They all prostrated except Iblis. Abba was stakbara. He refused and he was arrogant. Wakanamin al kafirin. And he was amongst those who disbelieved. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questioned him as to why he refused to prostrate, Ma mana aka alla tasjuda id amartuk. Kala ana khayru min khalaqtani min na wa khalaqtahu min tleen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, And what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you to? Who are you to prevent, or who are you to refuse to prostrate when I commanded you to? And Iblis, he said, I'm better than him. His statement, I'm better than him, was as a result of his own insecurity, knowing that he wasn't better than him. This is how we puff ourselves up with pride. Right? We, we make ourselves look bigger and we over exaggerate our affairs to make ourselves look better than people that we are actually inferior of. Yeah. His arrogance was fueled by self-hatred, 
which was the refusal to recognize his own limitations out of fear that someone else might actually be better than him. He over-exaggerated his greatness out of fear that someone would be greater than him. And brothers and sisters understand that the way that you think about yourself will determine how others think about you and how others engage and, and react, with, and react to you. Much of what we receive from the world, from how people engage us, is based upon how they see us treat ourselves. A person is going to engage you based upon how they see you treat yourself. If you treat yourself with self-respect, then a person has no other choice but to approach you, to approach you with respect. Because they see the way you care for yourself. They see that you have, you have you know, taken strength in the power of no. You know how to say no. And while that may make some people angry, it actually gives you autonomy. Some of us don't know how to say no because we're too worried about how it's going to make the other person feel, but totally overlooking how your yes is going to make you feel. How many times have we said yes to people and then regretted it later on? When you should have just said no right there in that moment, but you couldn't because you were here again, too worried about what others think rather than, about, rather than thinking about what you think. Iblis, in an attempt to make himself seem better than Adam, due to his own fear and insecurity, highlighted something that was not really a virtue. He said, you created me from fire and you created him from dirt. When in fact, fire is not actually better than dirt. Fire burns and destroys. Dirt builds and it's humble because it's on the ground. We walk on it. It's humble and we can use it to build things. Fire destroys, burns, scorches. And rather than Iblis taking pride in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the privilege to worship him amongst the angels, Allah sent you to the earth to restore order amongst the jinn, and all of the other privileges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, he pulled from a place that he thought was going to make himself look better than Adam out of fear. Iblis is afraid of the human being. But he instills fear in us by the dunya, the things that he has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him some, some level of control over. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that is shaitan who instills fear in you with his awliya, with the people and the things that he controls. So don't fear him. And fear me. Meaning if indeed you are truly believers. Fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you fear Allah, the more Allah will make everything humble themselves to you. But the more you fear others and don't fear Allah, the more Allah will leave you in your fear of others. And unfortunately, this is, you know, what we would say in modern day times, self-hatred. Hatred of yourself. Meaning, you are so insecure, so inferior in front of the greatness of others, you don't believe that the two of you can exist in the same space at the same time. So you have to shrink yourself or over-exaggerate yourself in order to exist in the presence of somebody else's greatness. Because if Shaitan had just prostrated, Shaitan, Iblis, had just prostrated himself to Adam, he would have come to realization that Adam is great in his own regard, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a status and a privilege that he didn't give to any other jinn, so you are still great in some regard. But here again, looking at what everybody else has, looking at what somebody else has, you fail to see your own blessing. And this is what makes practicing certain aspects of the religion challenging for many of us today. Because much of our religion requires self-love. Did you know that? Much of our deen requires self-love. When we make dua, we make dua for ourselves first. And then we make dua for someone else. The Prophet said, Start with yourself and then those whom you are responsible for. That's, that's, that's self-love. Putting your values Putting the things that you consider important first. That's self-love. And in order for you to love others, you have to love yourself first. 
The Prophet said, None of you truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. You can't love for your brother what you love for yourself if you don't love for yourself. If you don't care about yourself, then how can I expect you to care about me? And so in Islam, we're taught to take care of ourselves first. And I'll leave you with a few things that we can utilize to help us avoid, you know, self-hatred or self-hating behaviors. Number one, stop placing imagined limitations on yourself. Stop telling yourself you can't do it. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything is possible. Allah has the keys to the heavens and the earth. He can make anything happen. Yusha ibn Nun asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop the sun from setting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped the sun from setting. Until he got to uh, Jerusalem and fought the Jabbarin and retrieved Bayt al Maqdis from them. This, this, real, this really happened in real time. This is not just some type of fable that we tell to make ourselves feel good about our religious practices. These are things that actually happened. Ibrahim walked away from his wife, Hajar, and made dua for her. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down an angel, struck the earth, and water began to gush up out of the earth. And it was upon her to take that and do something great with it. And today, alhamdulillah, every time you sip from the well of Zamzam, it goes into the scales of good of Hajar. Think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes just places greatness in your lap. But you have to recognize that. Stop putting self-imposed limitations on yourself. Number two, challenging the deconstructive thoughts that you have about yourself. We have constructive thoughts, things that we tell ourselves to make ourselves better. And we have deconstructive thoughts, those, that we t those things we tell ourselves to, you know, to pull from us, to subtract from our greatness. Oh, you can't do this. This person never did this. That one never did this. Your mom never graduated from college. This person never did that. Or your dad never became successful at this. So what makes you think you can do it? And you have to rise above that. Number three, confront the people around you who have contributed to your self-hatred. Yeah, there's people who have contributed to our self-hatred. The way that we see ourselves in many regards, in many instances, is a product of the environments that we were raised in. People like to never let you forget mistakes that you've made in your life. Oh, so you're going to do this again? They keep reminding you because they want to keep you in that little box. Because that makes them comfortable. Because God forbid you get outside of that box that they put you in. And you have to confront that. Confront the people who have contributed to your self-hatred. They may have been projecting on you their own self-hatred and you didn't even realize it. Number five, realizing that self-love is the most powerful love, the most powerful love that you can have, and is the magnet for the love of others. People will only love you to the extent that you love yourself. If you show that you value yourself and you love yourself and you carry yourself in that way, it forces other people to engage you like that. That becomes the standard or otherwise leave you alone. And lastly, realize that your greatness and the greatness of others can actually coexist. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You don't have to shrink in the face of somebody else's greatness. You can recognize their greatness, but recognize your own greatness at the same token. You don't have to shrink in front of someone else. We are in the, the, the time of celebrity worship. If you're on social media, if you're on Instagram, or if you're on TikTok and you have a ton of followers, then somehow, some way, you are, and your greatness is, you know, overshadows the greatness of others, or more importantly, the greatness of yourself. No, I can recognize that, you know, you're influential, you have a following, you're this, you're that, but I don't have to over-exaggerate my praise of you and shrink in your presence, right, to acknowledge how great you are to acknowledge the great things that you have done. And it's to the point where some people expect that. When you have confidence and you approach someone and you say, hey, you know, I appreciate what you're doing, and you say it with confidence, not from a place of inferiority, but you say it from a place of confidence and respect, mutual respect, the person almost takes that as a sign of disrespect because you didn't lower yourself, you didn't humble yourself in front of them. I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we learn how to conquer our own demons 
Conquering our demons gives us freedom, brothers and sisters. Being able to take a look at yourself in the mirror and begin to address your own personal demons that have been with us for so long. It gives you freedom. Freedom that you don't have to live with those demons anymore. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al Oh Allah, we ask you for the good of this life and the good of the hereafter and to save us from the hellfire. Allahumma kfina bi halalika an haramika. Oh Allah, make the halal sufficient for us so we don't need the haram. Wa aghnina bi fadlika amman siwaka. And give us self sufficiency with your richness, with your, with your bounty, so that we don't need the richness or the bounty of others. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al Oh Allah, we ask you for the good of this life and the good of the hereafter and to save us from the hellfire. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al jannah wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amal. Oh Allah, we ask you for jannah and what will bring us closer to it from statements and actions. Wa na'udhu bika min al nari wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin wa amal. Oh Allah, we seek refuge with you from the hellfire and what will bring us closer to it from statements and actions. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min sharri anfusina. ومن شر الشيطان ومن شر شركه وان اقترف على نفسي على انفسنا سوءا او نجره بالمؤمن Oh Allah, we seek refuge with you from the evil of our own souls and from the evil of shaitan and his shirk that he tries to impose upon us. And we seek refuge with you that we impose our evil on, the, on, on another Muslim brother or Muslim sister without knowing. Oh Allah, we ask you for your forgiveness. Allahumma maghfiratuk. Allahumma maghfiratuk. Allahumma maghfiratuk. Allahumma maghfiratuk. Allahumma فلا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين وأصلح لنا شأننا كلها لا إله إلا أنت Oh Allah, your forgiveness is what we hope for. Do not leave us to fend for ourselves, not even for the time that it takes the blink of an, a blink of eye and rectify for us our affairs. There is none that deserves worship except you. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah.